Hello, I'm Mike Mulvihill. On the 16th of December 2017, I spoke with Christy Wynne from Boyle in County Roscommon about the big snow of 1947. Over the years, Christy has compiled a beautiful collection of stories from that time period and from the big snow of 1947. And while we were chatting, he shared some of those stories with me. We're with Christy Wynne Main Street in Boyle and thanks for agreeing to take part on the programme, Christy. You're very welcome, Michael. Glad to have you here. I'm Christy Wynne from uh, Main Street Boyle. I've been a news agent there for the last 50, 60 years and uh, I'm still here. And you've got some fantastic stories in a book here uh, which you've written over the years and one of those in the book is a recollection of the blizzard of 1947. Yeah, that's right, Michael. I was only 10 years old uh, on that occasion. It it happened on the night of the Monday, the 24th of February 1947. I was just 10 years of age. But I actually went to school that day, but Mother God rest her, I think, didn't realise how heavy the snowfall was like until perhaps later on that morning. But however, I did head off to school that particular morning, so I have written a little story about it. Would you like me to read a little extract from it? We'd love to hear it. Right, Michael, thank you. It began on the night of the 24th of January 1947. The greatest snowfall of the century was on its way. Today it's just remembered simply as the blizzard. As I look back on those far-off days when I was a young 10-year-old, I recall in a special way the words of a favourite poet of mine, William Wordsworth, when he wrote, Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. And so it was. For weeks before, an Arctic wind had been blowing across the land, and snow was the topic on everybody's lips. As I went to bed on that Monday, Monday night, dreaming dreams, the first flakes were beginning to fall. Next morning when I woke up and looked down on the street below, I could barely recognise it. Shop fronts, shop windows, hall doors had literally disappeared under a massive blanket of snow. The rooftops opposite looked strangely different with their snow-capped chimneys standing out stark and weird against a snow-filled sky. The birds that chattered each morning on the moss-covered slates and perched in a row along the telegraph lines were nowhere to be seen. You've painted some lovely pictures there, Christy, of 1947. And you can just picture the the chimneys covered in snow. The snow, it really was high at the time. Oh, it was. I mean, it it snowed for almost three days. It snowed all that Monday night, Tuesday, and into midday on Wednesday. So continuously, like nonstop, as far as I can truly recall. There was... Certainly an average of six, seven foot of snow on the streets. But there were uh, uh, places uh, in the fields and uh, there were snow drifts as high as 15, 20 feet against gable walls and in the fields outside town, you know. The, the town, Boyle Town was actually isolated. No buses could come through or trains for four or five days at least, if not a week. And of course, there was no school, which was which was the icing on the cake for a young ten-year-old. But like the snow level on the ground on the Tuesday morning would be surely two, three foot deep. It snowed all Tuesday, and it snowed all Tuesday night and into Wednesday about midday. So that the end result was that like uh, the streets of Boyle would would probably have an average of five, six, seven foot of snow, six foot of snow at least. And the fields outside, like, uh, the, the snow had reached the same level as the ditches in the fields, which mean the, the landmarks that we knew as children were actually lost for a while, had disappeared. And Noel McPartland, at the start of the programme, he spoke about, you know, the snow been in from Shambo up to the top windows and that you could come out on from your top window and walk across the snow 
to the roof of the other house. Yes, yes, it would be not 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 unsimilar here here in Boyle. There was similar similar situations, and uh, of course there were stories of a postman getting lost in the snow because he went off on his delivery that morning in the early hours, not realizing again uh, maybe uh, the amount of snow that that had fallen, and he was yet to cover a rural area out near Lagara. A number of townlands out there, um, Ballinulta, Tony Tuscan, or Tony Naden, I should say, Colonel Meal to Derry Nockerton, overlooking the a b- beautiful area in summer, but it was completely isolated and uh, the, uh, the uh, Johnny the postman failed to return home. So it transpired he, he was missing or lost until the following Saturday when he eventually got back into Boyle, but he was, he was found by a, a farmer out. Uh, looking for his sheep, and he found Johnny in one of his out out offices or sheds, and he was he was almost f- frozen to death, like he was he was semi conscious, and he brought him to his home, and he kept them there from the from the Tuesday until the following Saturday, and eventually, like he was able to get him back into boil, so that was that was one of the famous stories. From from the blizzard and actually the house that harboured them or the Good Samaritan, it's still there. There's a different man in it now, but uh, the same house is still standing. And uh, in any time a snowfall comes about, the house is pointed out as the house that saved Johnny Gormley, the postman. Going back to your selection of short stories, Christy, you've got another story here. Yeah, well, I, well, I have one night that I, I was, uh, I more or less felt that there, there was something unique about it. So I referred to the man as the marathon man. If you can, if you like, I read, read, read a few lines of it because this gentleman who is dead now, he told me his story a few years just before he died. So, if you like, I'll just, I'll just. That'd be lovely. Of the many stories of courage and endurance to come out of that period, one of the most memorable for me must be that of the Marathon Man. Patrick told me his story some months before he died, and it surely is one for the record books. He left his home about five miles outside Boyle late on the Monday evening of the blizzard on his bicycle. His destination was Kiluni Railway Station, about 20 miles away, where he was to board a train for Inniskillen and thence to Belfast, where he did business a number of times a year. It was a journey he had made on numerous occasions before and thought little of it. When he set out that evening, the weather was extremely cold but dry. And a short time later, it started to snow. Conditions were getting worse by the minute and the blinding snow made it impossible for him to cycle. When he eventually reached Ballymo, 10 miles on, he left his bicycle at the railway station in the care of the station master, a man he knew well. He then continued his journey on foot to Colony, which was another 10 miles, and eventually arrived there cold, weather-beaten and very disappointed. All transport had been cancelled due to the awful weather conditions, so his marathon journey had all been in vain. But he now faced a new and tougher challenge or task as he had to find his way back home all the way on foot, which was 20 miles away. He couldn't afford to be away at home for an indefinite period of time. The snow on the roads had now reached the the, the same level as the ditches, blotting out practically every landmark that one might be familiar with. A sea of white stretched to the horizon on all sides. For Patrick, the situation looked hopeless. Then the proverbial spark from heaven came his way. Across the fields in the distance, he recognised the stretch of telegraph poles that run parallel with the railway track. Slowly and doggedly, he struggled across the frozen landscape till he reached the embankment and slid his way down onto the railway line, the Dublin Sligo railway line. From there, he continued his marathon journey along the, this track through Ballymote Station, Kilfree Junction, and Mullock Row, a little townland uh, just a little outside uh, Kilfree Junction, a distance of almost 15 miles. Knowing him was in, ho- in home territory near Mullock Row Bridge, he left the railway track and continued the last five miles of his extraordinary journey by road. 
The marathon man had made had made his way home, and his story is now part of local history. That was some journey, so it was, Christy. It's, it certainly was. Like uh, I, I found it hard to believe, but uh, that is a fact. There's no doubt about it. And the man told me a story just a few years before he died, and uh, and I you thought it was so extraordinary that when I decided to write some little story on the blizzard, I would have to include the story of Pat Shaw because it's 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 unique. It is, and it's lovely to have it documented, and it's lovely to hear it and to broadcast it on this. Yes. Program about the big snow of 1947 on Shannon Side, Northern Sound. So I guess, Christy, it was almost like Christmas waking up to a blanket of white snow. Yes, it was indeed, exactly. Something unforgettable. And yet yeah, there are so many stories attached to it, you know, that that's why I decided to write the story in the first instance. But there are so many uh, little, little things that happened in, uh, yeah, during that period. Uh, you know, I just couldn't forget them. I have another small one on uh, on the kids playing on the crescent, if, if you like to hear it. I just, just uh, what I have written about it. Yeah, we'd love to hear it, Christy. As the days passed, the frozen snow had turned the town into a winter playground, with green streets and the crescent transformed into a skating rink. Lorries, cars were in short supply in those days, so there was little problem for the youth to try out their skills. Anything that moved on ice made its appearance. Push cars, broken down prams, enamel basins, aluminium trays, stools on their end could be seen racing helter-skelter down the hill with children hanging on for dear life. The sound of laughter was everywhere. And if or when a minor collision did occur, few tears were shed. All was forgotten in the sheer joy of the moment. And a a lovely uh, memory there from Christy to do with the big snow of 1947. And he's got a lot of stories. And Christy, you'll have to see about probably getting some of these published into a book sometime. Yeah, well, I, I I would hope to. Like I've been uh, I've been uh, invited by several people to sort of combine all all together and uh, and make make a book of it that would be of interest to a lot of our uh, immigrants, the people who have gone to England and America, and that still have wonderful memories of Boyle and that uh, they like reading about it. So that uh, I I've, I've been asked, like, and I do feel like doing it, but. Uh, but uh, I'm and, a slow starter. Well, I know that when when I was younger, coming down to Boyle, down to Loch Key, and it's now uh, a huge uh, family place for weekends and during the week as well, where people go to walk and there's great activities to do there at Loch Key. But in 1947, I'm trying to visualise what it would have been like during the big snow. Yeah, there's no doubt it was extraordinary in the sense that uh, to see a lake frozen over was unbelievable, certainly for a 10-year-old. So I, I'll read a little extract of what I, I wrote about it from my memory of it. During all this period, Loch Key was frozen over and it too became a winter playground. Stories survive of Cayley dances being held along the lake shore at Smotherna, a little townland down at the bottom of the lake. Uh, with bonfires ablaze and the sound of accordions and bowrons echoing across the frozen waste as the dancing continued into the early hours. Una Vaughan and her lover, Tom Costello, would have loved every minute of it as they listened to it from their quiet, lonely graves on far-off Trinity Island. The fun and sport came to a peak on Sundays when many took to skating on the frozen lake. A vantage point on top of the Rock of Dune gave one a panoramic view. It was a beginner's paradise with the young and old indulging in a sport that was unlikely to be seen ever again on Loch Key. So people were out on, on Loch Key and like the water is, walking, the water is deep the there. Island, walking uh, literally groups of people walking to the island, uh, with, uh, the nearer islands, particularly what we call Church Island and 
uh, Castle Island from the Rockingham side and so on. They'd be only about a half a mile to a mile out, but uh, I have se- I remember seeing them from the Dune Shore, people walking to Church Island, and it was unbelievable, they said, that, that people could actually walk to an island. And as regards the Cayley, the Cayley dancing down at Corrigan Row, which is down near the end of the lake where it joins up with the Shannon, it was literally people dancing on ice. I'm told, like, I, I, I wasn't down there, but I remember being told that a bonfire may be just on the shoreline, of course, mm. but with bowruns and fiddles and accordions and a, a group enjoying life, they were actually out on the ice dancing. So it was a story of dancing on ice. Going back to the story that you told of Lockheed there, Smutrana. Smutrana, have I got that right? A lovely, yeah, yeah, Smutrana, yeah, that's, a lovely sounding townland. It is, yeah. That's uh, that's one of the little townlands uh, overlooking the lake. And there's there's uh, another another little spot that uh, has quite a kind of a, 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 a nice sound about it. Tinarina. That's at the bottom of the, just at the very end of the lake. Uh, uh, the, the level of the lake tapers off and you could actually walk a few hundred yards out almost from Tinarina. But you have Smithena, Smithena Corrigano, Tinarina, Carnacarta, Dune, of course. They have so many lovely names. Yeah, lovely old and there's a, name, a Dune at Ballina Wing beside Shemoor as well. Ah. Dune, Dune Well oh, and yes, Dune Shemore. Rock. Yes, yes, I, I know of Shemoor, all right, that's... Uh, uh, that's out near, is it? Uh, Efren, is that or out yeah. on that road? Yeah. And uh, <coughs> She Moore would have been featured, of course, in the Larry Cunningham song, right. She Moore, that fa- fairy hill. Right. That's right. That's a uh, lovely Leitrim. Lovely that's Leitrim. Right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I remember my friend, uh, Noel McPartland, uh, a friend of mine that I knew in our school days in uh, St. Mel's. I remember hearing Noel singing that when he came out first in the Bush Hotel one night after. Uh, an event or a, a concert. We were all in good forum and uh, J- uh, Larry Cunningham was only after making the record, so I'm going back a, a long time, maybe the late 60s or something. But Noel sang it beautifully that night. He got, yeah. he got, he got great applause for it. Uh, no better man to <laughs> sing a song. Yes, yes, yes. So you've got uh, maybe one, one final story for us <clears> on <throat> the programme, Christy. Yeah. And these are fantastic stories that we're hearing. They're from a personal collection of stories yes, yes. which Christy has put <coughs> together. And you never know, maybe in the future we might see this book on the shelves in Boyle and surrounding areas. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, there's a small piece here coming near the end, all right. If you like, I'll read it to taper it off. Youth was having the time of his life and could do no wrong. Finally, after the biblical 40 days, the great thaw had set in. As the ice melted on the roofs, huge slabs crashed onto the streets below like a clap of thunder. Yes. Any, any loiterer unlucky to be caught under one of them would hardly rise again. It was the end game and there was a terrible finality about it. The great blizzard was at an end and we were watching its death throes. It was unlikely we would ever see anything like it again in a lifetime. For the young, it was indeed the best of times. For the old and infirm, it was probably the worst of times. And for the birds of the air, the animals of the fields, it must surely have been a nightmare. And I think that's probably a lovely moment to go out on the programme today and Christy, thank you for sharing your stories with us. You're very, very welcome, Michael. I'm glad to be to be uh, of assistance to you. My thanks to Christy Wynn from Main Street in Boyle in County Roscommon for speaking to me on the 16th of December 2017. You can hear some of the stories which featured in this conversation on the documentary On the Big Snow of 1947. Have a little look around this website and other websites where you might find some of my content. So, thank you for listening to this and until next time, goodbye.